Ladies and gentlemen, they can see to our case when they say that women and mothers play no role in society other than to birth children. Because ladies and gentlemen, they haven't listened to our harms. They haven't listened to our harms and explicitly detailed why it is so damaging and so harmful to women when they are told that the, the pain of childbirth, the pain of potentially not being able to financially support your child, the pain of, being, of your child being, of your child's development being out of your control is made up by the fact that it is a rewarding experience and therefore you must go contribute to society. They can see to all of our harms, moreover that positive case doesn't even exist. Why have we won this debate? We won this debate according to several responses and I've been proving to you with additional my speech why this is worse in terms of the parental dynamic but before that, let's dismantle their case. So what is their first response? Their first response is that this narrative can exist in coexistence with others such as mothers finding reward in other things just pursuing their job. This isn't true to the debate because we've already told you how this narrative is one that excludes other narratives. We told you in their speech that the act of motherhood is inherently taxing and comes at a cost to other aspects of your life. Therefore, in that instance, we would tell you that a narrative that promotes this as being a blanket benefit to all women is therefore one that says that there is a blanket benefit that is compensating the cost of motherhood. In those instances, we would tell you that there is the exclusion of other narratives. Secondly, we told you what a widespread narrative is. This takes off their stuff about when they tell us that, um, no, right, this doesn't force women into certain behavior. But it does, because what it does is it overcomes your utility calculus. Because the utility calculus you make as a woman is that there's a certain cost to bring a child into this world, but this cost is recompensated by the reward I can potentially get. We've attacked that reward and we've told you that it doesn't apply for all women. Therefore, in those instances, their policy, their, their application for their world is illegitimate. Secondly, we will tell you that societal pressures are increased because now not only can your woman, not only can your parents and your family tell you there's a need for you to have children and bring children to this world because that is your role in society, but in addition they can tell you that it's fine because there is a potential for reward. When that reward doesn't exist, when that reward is dubious, and that can be proven to you in our first speech because not all women are financially capable of taking care of their children, not all women are promotionally capable of taking care of their children, in that instance we will not take it. Secondly, they respond by saying that we, we, we push the framing on them with this debate. We told that this debate is specifically about the mothers that don't find value in motherhood and how you harm them. The mothers that don't fit in. What was their response to this? The response was that some mothers don't find a home. However, we think we can evolve the system eventually in the future to incorporate those mothers. One, this debate is valuable. They can't teach free frame itself by saying that because this debate has to take into account the harms of what happens when that narrative is widespread. They can't just say that we have the potential to create other narratives. Two, we will tell you that there is no response to the harms that we have given you. It's not enough for them to just say that there is a potential for your life to get better with your child, because in many instances it isn't. When there is financial cost to bring up that child, it means that it comes a direct cost to you empowering yourself. It means you can't search for a job because you are forced to take care of a child 24-7. It means additionally that there is an emotional cost. Because sometimes women aren't prepared for the emotional cost of bringing a child into this world. The emotional cost of ensuring that you that, that you develop them and intrinsically linking your reward to how they are developed. Because that's the second harm that we warned you that they really haven't responded to. Because we told you that it harms women who are also currently mothers. How exactly does this happen? Because the emotional harm is incredibly bad when you are told that your drug addicted son is your fault. Because the reward is inherently linked to how you bring up that child. Because they are saying, they're saying that the reward is inherently how you bring up that child. But what does this look like? It looks like telling women that the reward of motherhood is going to be raising a child that eventually becomes a doctor. Therefore, what it implicitly implies is that your effort and your engagement into bringing that child up is how you get that reward. So in an instance where that doesn't happen, in an instance where your child spirals out of your control, you feel emotionally guilty. You feel guilt-ridden because you weren't able to get that reward because you failed. That's something that's going to be harmful. Before I move into my response, my substantive speech, yes. Please show the correlation of the belief in it being a custom for women to have children. So sorry, please do that. Please show the correlation of the, of the, of the belief and then it being a custom to have a child then. Well, the belief obviously correlates the custom to have a child. Because what a belief inherently does, and especially a widespread belief, is it coerces people into certain behavior, not only because of societal pressures, but also because of how it influences your behavior and how you make that social cost. Because it's ingrained to you from a young age, it's all contact with women in our first speech. But let's move on to my substantive speech, proving to you why this is likely to harm the relationship between mother and child, especially the development of that child. 
What exactly does this narrative say? First off, this narrative says that the reward of motherhood is inherently the emotional prize. It's your child's gratefulness, but you bring them up. It's your child's loving you back, but you bring them up. How is this incredibly harmful for that relationship? Because children aren't like that. Children aren't inherently volatile. They'll get angry for no reason whatsoever. They'll start hating you for no reason whatsoever. In those instances, what is mother, what are mothers likely to do? What does this narrative say that mothers should do? It says that mothers will continue to try and seek that emotional acceptance. It says that mothers will continue to try and seek that love and that gratefulness. In those instances, it's incredibly harmful because you create a relationship in which the mother is just continually giving with no, with, with, with no consideration of how it affects the development of that child. Because ladies and gentlemen, it looks like mothers give their children whatever they want, even though in some instances they ought not. Secondly, how does it harm the father's role in parenting? And I think this is also an incredibly important part of this debate. Because what exactly this widespread belief emphasizes is that the role of the mother in raising a child is the most important one. Because it says that the role of a mother is the one that ought to be rewarded and therefore the one that ought to be incentivized. How exactly does this harm the dynamic now between father and mother? Because the reward emphasizes the mother's reward. It says that at the point at which mothers don't find that experience work, at the point at which mothers decide they aren't any more capable of taking care of that child, it isn't their responsibility to give it off to the father because there is an inherent reward in that experience. If you don't find that reward, you aren't trying hard enough. This is incredibly awful because we've already analyzed to you in our first speech why there are some subjective conditions that may make these mothers incapable of being bearing a child. This not only looks like my natural conditions, also it looks like characteristics. If you are not inherently a caregiver, if you are not inherently prone to loving things, then how are you supposed to take care of a child and a society that forces you to? What does that relationship look like? It's one that's incredibly harmful. Moreover, it gives bargaining power to the men within a relationship. It says that the, the, the men are accurate and are justified in saying that you ought to be the ones who take care of this child because you, there is a reward to this experience. I can opt out of taking care of that child and I can pursue my work because there is a reward Point. to this experience. In those instances, we would take to harm that dynamic. Before I continue, yes. Comment on the fact where the word is love for the kid and not the outcome such as the athletes that the kid made for love. You see, that's the problem here. We understand that some women may inherently love their child. We understand that some mothers may inherently love their children. But you aren't dealing with the blanket harms of when you say this is the this is the norm for all women within that society. When you incentivize women who aren't capable of being mothers, who don't want to be mothers, into that situation because the societal pressures are compensated by the fact that they expect some kind of reward. I've already analyzed to you why that's harmful to your relationship between mother and child, but let's deal with their response. Anyway, what do they tell us? They tell us that there's the, the, the potential for you to love a child, but you're not dealing with the instances in which that potential doesn't exist. Because love is an absolute. In many instances, that child can develop out of your control. That child has interaction with other people outside of their parents. That child can grow in a separately different way as you expect them to. Even in those instances, it's abhorrent to say that the mother will still love that child, when even though they're acting against his wishes. We tell you that in those instances, the exact harm of this debate is that mother or mothers are forced to find inherent value in this love, when that, when that value may not always exist for all people. We think that the world in our side is one in which mothers evaluate their own circumstances, their own behavior, their own characteristics, and then decide whether or not to have a child. We think that an instance in which you are always told that this experience is going to be rewarding is not only one that is harmful to women, it's also harmful to relationships.